Welcome everybody to a special edition of Live from My Drum Room. Today my very special guest is my old friend Matt Sorum. Uh, no stranger to all you drummers. Drummer for The Cult, Guns N' Roses, Velvet Revolver, Kings of Chaos, uh, Hollywood Vampires, a million, a million more gigs. Uh, so I'm really excited to have Matt here with me today. And um, he's making time because he's a busy man. And so without any further ado, I'm going to welcome my old buddy, old meaning from a long time, Matt Sorum. What? What are you doing <laughs> busting into my house on Zoom? What the hell is going on? Uh, you know, that's what happens when you leave your camera on. You know, you never know who's going who's gonna to zoom, zoom in on you. Wow, I'm just like hanging out here in Palm Springs next to my wife's closet, <laughs> counting all the dollars I've spent on shoes and bags from years of drumming. This is the proof of the pudding right here. That's that's what, you know, working your ass off for the last 35 years is, you know, that's what you get. You get to buy your wife some really nice stuff. Well, you know, you got to pay, you got to pay the piper. You know what that's I'm saying? Right. Yeah. You have you want to have fun? Well, hey. Guess what? <laughs> Well, you know what they say, happy wife, happy life. Always. Oh, so. I learned that the hard way, you know, it took me a while, but yeah. I figured it out finally. <laughs> it's good to see you, buddy, man. Uh, you know, I, I appreciate you making time. I, I, I want to like tell everybody that by the time this airs a couple of weeks from now, your book will already be out. But I, uh, Matt is releasing his autobiography on May 10th and, um, when I reached out to you a couple weeks ago, I didn't know this. I just felt like we were long overdue to do something like this. And then I found out you had this book coming out and the timing's perfect. So, so thanks for doing cool. this. Yeah. Well, no, I'm, I'm just, I canceled everybody else, but you, <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, well, I know that guy. <laughs> Thank you. I know you're probably doing and, a ton uh, of these and I, and I appreciate it. No, I I'm serious. I'm not kidding you. I said, wow. John, we go, we go back to like 89 that's right. The cult. That's right, man. And there was a guy, Mike Morse. At Zildjian. Soul. I know, I know. Matt, I got to tell you, I actually looked up the date because I knew it was 89. I started at Zildjian that summer, that, that May. And I found the date. It was July, maybe July something, 1989, Worcester Centrum, The Cult, and, and uh, Metallica. Yeah. You guys are on tour with Metallica. And... Jimmy, uh, Timmy Doyle had called me like ahead of time and needed some stuff for you. And, and as you said, our old friend, Mike Morris had said, you got to check out Matt Sorum. And I didn't know you then. I hadn't met you yet. Yeah. Um, I was so blown away. I was so, you know, I mean, Lars is Lars, Metallica is Metallica, but you, you stole the show. The cult stole the show that night, as far as I was concerned. And I feel like we, we were like instant buds. You were so cool and like immediately like you had that big smile on your face hey man you know thanks for coming you know and um yeah it was the beginning of a great friendship yeah that was cool man because we were up in your neighborhood are you still living up there in that way i am yep i'm still just outside of boston and um i mean and and I, not surprisingly it was only less than a year later that you were asked to join guns and roses right or maybe even six yeah, months about, or something uh, just around two years we did that tour and i thought man this is great i'm in a band i'm on a bus and you know i was happy i i felt like i had arrived you know yeah, and then yeah and then along came that other opportunity and i was like oh my god this is crazy and man. uh then it then it took off in a in a really crazy wild ride I always used to say if anyone remembers old school disneyland they used to be what's called the e-ticket and you used to go to Disneyland, and you would get E, D, C. It was different tickets for different rides. And I'd say, I got the E ticket for Mr. Toad's Wild Ride. <laughs> <laughs> Not to be confused with Ginger Baker, but... Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, things are off, and it, it, it got really kooky. And Timmy Doyle came with me on that trip. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, we, we, we took off as a team, and... You know, it was great. That probably helped. I got I have to think that moving into, I mean, Guns N' Roses at that time, there was no band bigger in the world. And 
And to have your kind of right-hand man there with you had to be at least, you know, help you through that kind of a transition from as big as the cult was going to well, I remember band. calling you guys and going, I need really big symbols. Big... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I had a 24 inch ping ride. I don't know if you remember, but that thing was massive. Yes. And in those days, you know, we didn't have in ears, man. It was just pure volume on stage and, you know, slash wielding like four Marshall stacks. And, you know, there was, I think eight Gailey and Kruger amps. And underneath my drum riser, I remember I had four 18 inch speakers for kick drum, just so I could, and believe it or not, as crazy as this sounds, you're outdoors on this massive stadium stages. And I'm like, turn it up. <laughs> and Man. The joke was get Matt a porta potty because the low end was serious. And, yeah. uh, but you kind of had to have it, you know? And I remember calling you guys and going, Hey, I want the biggest symbols possible. Cause I needed the decay to last. So, yeah. you know, I wanted to go. Boosh. And, Cause I remember I used to go see bands and cymbals would just go like, Bruce. and I'm like, yeah, what was yeah. that? It sounded like, you know, <laughs> yeah, some yeah. guy's up there playing like a 16 or something. And he's in front of a big rock band. I'm like, that's not going to cut it, man. No, no. I just remember Bonham going. Bah, bah, boo, 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 boo. I'm like, that, that's gotta be a 20. Yeah. It's at least yeah. a 20 inch crash. So I went, I remember going, the smallest was 18. I went up to 19, 20, and I actually had a 20 two crash as well on the backside yeah for that yeah. and you were playing the end. yeah and you were playing a rock crashes too i think which were the heavier ones and they you know they totally. were louder yeah yeah, yeah it's all a's yeah. in those days it's funny now i hear a's and i'm like ah i know you know, know i'm a full k guy now i'm like i don't know if that comes with age or whatever but now i hear an a and i'm like oh <laughs> you know i have a couple still that'll break out for the right bell thing. Like, yeah, I have all my, I have my original, original Zildjian 15 inch hats, rocks. Wow. And, wow. and they were the ones I played on all those tours. And I remember thinking, guys were like, wow, you're playing 15s? I'm like, well, yeah. Yeah. Now I play 16s. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, I play those 16, um, uh, Zilge, uh case the k like the k light 16 is that what they're i got called? both i got the sweets yeah. and i oh, got the, the yeah and i got the k lights and then because i was playing with gibbons yeah and he really likes a wide because it's a three-piece he likes like a wider hat and a little bit oh, slightly open but kind of like filling up the space yeah I yeah with like a kind yeah. of thing so <laughs> as you yeah and I'm like, give me some 16s. And he loved them. I'll bet. Yeah. Because he didn't really, if you watch ZZ Top now, like Frank Beard plays this, the hats a little bit more open. Mm -hmm. But back in the 70s, all those guys played the hat really tight. Really tight. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Intense. Right? Yeah. Yeah. But for live, Billy's like, open up the hat. Open up the hat. He didn't like that that tight thing live. Yeah. So but like, you, like, like you say, it fills in a lot of space when you, when you open those hats, just a little bit, it just a little bit more air, a little bit more space. Yeah. If you think yeah. about those great seventies records, everything was super dry. Yeah. It yeah. wasn't like big, massive reverbs and shit till the eighties. Right. And exactly. everything had its space, but the drumming was tight. Thumpy drums. Boom, 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 boom. Yep. Right. Yep. And I love that because I and I would go back and study those early records as easy top and play it exactly like that. Billy go open up the hat a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. What you know, cool, play the rest of it pretty yeah. similar, you know. That's so cool. That's so cool. Well, when I saw you with the cult, I remember and I, I could correct me if I'm wrong, I, I could be wrong about this, but I I were you playing like two Chinas in front like Terry Bozio? Or yeah, I love Terry in those days. When he when he when Terry went into missing persons, every drummer in town, you know, from Bissonette to me to everyone was like, dude, have you seen Terry Bozio? Yeah. And we'd all go out and watch 
Terry play when he had the crazy hair. Yeah. And you go, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and we all got big pangs. <laughs> and I used to say, I had those pangs to deflect shoes opening from Metallica. It's like, <laughs> but literally, I swear to God, like we would open for Justice for All. And it was like, yeah. In those days, you remember, you saw I do. it. Yeah, I saw it. It was 90, 95% dudes that were like, and they didn't really care for the cult, you know? <laughs> we were like a, yeah. a girl band, you know? We were like, so some shoes did come up and those pangs will save my ass. Well, <laughs> I think I he told me this. I think I, you know? <laughs> but, but yeah, I had two pangs. Yeah. I, I started out with like three rack toms. I remember that. Yep. And by the end of the tour, I was like, I'm going to strip it down and go to one rack. And I simplified my whole setup from my career going forward. So you had already, when you went, by the time you got in Guns N' Roses, you had, you had changed your setup to what you ended up with. The, like you say, the more simplified. Cause when I saw you, you had exactly, you had three rack toms, maybe two floor toms. Yeah. It was two floors. Yeah. The two Chinese. And you reminded me, I mean, in a, in a, in a, like a um not not in any way copying terry but it you, you were remit you know i could tell he was an influence in some of the stuff you were playing and you incorporated that, you know. that. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the, I mean, the cult's so straight you know so sort of like straight ahead but you were incorporating some cool shit like some really yeah double bass stuff. drums were not acceptable with the cult right i mean there's yeah. a story in my book where i auditioned for david lee roth and steve by and Billy Sheehan, the early, early version of the band that Greg Bissonnette had, ended up getting. All these yeah. drummers went down to SIR to, to, to rehearse or, or audition. Right. And I remember uh, going in there and it was like Mark Craney. And remember Mark Craney? Oh, yeah, man. Sure. Uh, from Gino Vanelli and Yeah. Jethro Tell. Oh, so great. Great and drummer. All these guys were in line. I'm like, I'm going home. <laughs> Like, this is like it's out of my league. And I remember going in there and Steve Vai, there was a double bass drum kit that they had rented. And I went and sat down behind the kit and I actually picked up one bass drum and moved it. And and Steve Vai goes, hmm, what are you doing? I go, I don't play double bass. And he went, hmm. Oh, yeah. man. One demerit, right? <laughs> and, and so I ended up playing, I grew up with Ian Pace and like Bonham and it was all about one pedal. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I ended up not getting the, um, the, the gig, obviously. And out of that, I ended up going on to play with Ed Mann, though, the vibes player from Frank Zappa's band. Steve said, know. hey, I got this drummer. I think he'd be really good for you guys, which was real outside shit for me. It was. Oh, yeah. But I was into like, Return to Forever, and you know, I loved Al Demiola and Lenny White and Billy Cobham. And oh yeah, yeah. So I, I would, you know, I can't say I'm there without any more. But when I was younger, I was pretty well versed in a lot of that flam accent fills. And well, so anyway, I ended up playing yeah. with him. But then, then I went and I, and I'm like, shit, man, I bet, I better woodshed my double kick playing, right? So I got a, I got a double bass kit. I remember it was a, it was a Tama kit and uh, I don't remember how I got a hold of it, but it basically sat in there all day and just, right? I was like, <laughs> <laughs> and, and I went in to audition for the cult and I set that big kit up and they walked in and went, no, no double bass. So I went, oh man. At that point, shit down. <laughs> yeah. At that point, I picked up the bass drum again, moved it, set my setup the way I, and then I went. That's when I discovered the double pedal, and that was early days. You know, DW. Yeah. yeah. I believe it was a DW double pedal that I was using in those days because I, I think early on I signed a pedal deal with Chris Lombardi and John Good and those guys. Like I had a pedal deal. Right. Which was wacky, right? Might have done. Let me see if I did all 
hardware in those days. I you think, might have. no, no, I think I played Yamaha hardware because I was with Yamaha. And right. that, how that happened was, it's really funny. So I was managed by this guy, Howard Kaufman, who also managed Tommy Aldridge in, and the band Whitesnake. Yeah. So when I got the cult gig, they said the drummer, uh, this guy walks in, his name's Jimmy Ayers, very famous. You know him from Aerosmith camp. Yeah, yeah, sure. He came in, he goes, hey, mate, uh, Jimmy Ayers, do a manager for the Colt. Uh, and I do White Snake, and we're going to get you a black Yamaha drum kit. You're endorsed. And, <laughs> and whatever you want, just pick it out. So from that moment on, because of Tommy Aldridge, I was Yamaha and Dorsey. So when I went to GNR, I shifted straight over and I met Hagi, Hagi San. Yes. From Yamaha. <clears throat> and our old friend Steve Edelson. Yeah. Steve. Rest in peace is him as well. Our old buddy Steve. So Steve hooked me up and then I had I was I was ready. I was like, I got Zildjian, I got my Yamaha, and then Remo Belly. Yeah. Took me on. And that was great. I was you were like, representing. Wow. I mean, I got like everything I need. And I go, I better call Zildjian and get a gong. That's what I need. I need a gong. And it's like, <laughs> like growing up with Bonham and Keith Moon and those guys having gongs. I'm like, so rock and roll. Absolutely. Van Halen. I remember I got a 38 inch gong. Big sucker. In fact, I think. I think at one point I came to see you and when Timmy sees this, I think he'll remember it. Timmy Doyle, we're talking about Matt's um, longtime drum tech from back in the day. And I feel like you cracked it at one point, cracked a gong and we didn't, we used to import them in. We, I think Zilchin still does imports them from Wuhan. Yeah. And sometimes we didn't have them in stock and Timmy was kind of freaking out because you needed one. We didn't have one. And he's like calling me every day and I'm going, Timmy, I, man i don't know it's it, you know it's like it's on the boat it's going to be here you know next week or uh, uh, but it being the good tech that he was man he was <clears throat> he's on it he was on it yeah and he was trying well, there to was find two a version of the zildjian gong there was the kind of like i don't want to say it's low more low quality but there was i know the one you mean yeah <clears throat> i had that that's the one i cracked it yeah. wasn't wuhan like wuhan was like wow and you guys put the zildjian name on it Right. But I had the early version and I, those were kind of, I'm not saying, I'm not sure how they were cast. We got I those from the, somebody else too. Yeah. It wasn't from Wuhan. Cracked it. Yeah. And you know, it's not like I'm the rock, heavy rock guy. Cause I grew up in wind ensemble. I'm like, you gotta warm that sucker up. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Boosh, boosh. <laughs> and uh, it went, <laughs> but the one that I had after that, was the same gong I had for 30 years. And I cracked it on the very last show of the Hollywood Vampires in 2016. Wow. It cracked after 30 years. That's that's a pretty long life, man. That's, that's pretty amazing. And I was like, oh, it actually was very emotional for me. Yeah. I was like, oh. I mean, I mean, I'm just like, yeah, I mean, gongs can last forever, but at the same time, you know, moving it around and playing it and yeah, yeah I mean, that's, that's kind of moving around a lot. That's the problem, you know, is being yeah. picked up and thrown on stages and right, right. I'd be like, I had a big anvil case for that sucker, you know, that thing yeah. will beep. I mean, it was, uh, but I ended up, uh, I haven't, re I don't think I've replaced it yet because <laughs> now I go, hey, I'm bringing the gong. And they go, uh, we haven't got the uh, we haven't got the budget for that. You know, <laughs> you know uh, bringing a gong on a tour is like, OK, seriously. That's yeah. You're that's like, a big budget tour. Yeah, that's a, that's a real big budget tour. Yeah. Back in the day, man, we had like multiple setups, you know, like and I finally got rid of all those anvil cases literally like a couple of years ago and they were a massive. I stored them for like 20 years. Size of this house, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, I know. I sold my timpanies. I had timpani drums. Do you remember? 
I th- yeah, I think I do with with the cult. You had like a like a few that percussion. came out of the riser, and then I had one yeah. next to me like Bonham. I had like a more of a small. I think it was a twenty eight over there, and then I had the big guys. And we used to do one part in the show where it came out. There's a song called Sun King, and I go boom, 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 boom. And it looked really cool. And then it went down and went away and into the massive semi truck, you know, (laughs) once part of the show. But yeah, Yeah. I ended up selling those to Josh Freeze for um, for when he was in Nine Inch Nails. But I kept them for years. That's great. Never used them. Yeah. You know, but it's cool that you're talking about that because it was at a time when, like you say, there were like, whether it was budgets or like, if you said, I'm taking a gong and I'm taking timpani with me on the road, like they, it, they made it happen for you, right? I mean, that was how it was done back then, you know? Well, so, compared to Tommy Lee, I was lightweight, you know? I mean, could I imagine <laughs> walking in and going, hey, guys, I'm going to go up and down on a roller coaster and it's going to be like two semi trucks full of drums and, <laughs> and yeah, like, exactly. get out of here, you know? <laughs> I mean, I had a big drum riser, you know, I had a massive drum riser and... I remember that was my world. Me and Timmy, we had a tent behind it. And I'd go down there. And I remember the one thing I wanted was, hey, I go, let's do like a beach island bar kind of thing back here. <laughs> it's like, can you get me like a really cool palm tree? Do like a tiki, tiki kind of thing. <laughs> so when Slash would take his like 20 minute guitar solo, I'd come down off the riser into this tent we had like tiki lights and we did make so some cocktails you know it was about that was always around three quarters into the show so i could you know have a few extra knowing we were coming towards the end a little shot or something <laughs> occasionally invite friends in you know we'd have a little so timmy had that all set up and the the riser was all mesh aluminum so it was like metal and the drums would be all in the same spot every night. So they were all built into this metal, all the, every stand, but underneath it was hollow. Yeah. So I could, the, all the speakers were under there coming up at me. And then on each side of the riser were these, <laughs> basically I had my own PA. It was like, I, yeah. I saw you a couple of times and it was unbelievable. The production that you, guys <laughs> you had. came up I mean, on stage and sat on the kit and everything. Yeah. Yeah. And it wasn't uh, a big kit, but it looked big because it was a simple setup, but I used big toms. I remember in right. those days they were considered what they, what they call concert toms or um, probably power toms, right? Power. Power toms. Like, extra. Yeah. Extra depth. Yeah. My first was like a 14, but it was like 13 inches deep, you know? Yeah. Yeah massive and the kick was a big 24 but it was i think 18 deep and then we had that huge yamaha rack thing right. with all the mics on it and and then the timpani and lots of little fidgety things like i had like uh i had a little uh side snare yeah made it like joe Mont- joe montanary Remember him? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Great Jim stuff. Sat over there. And then some weird little, like, I used to like to mess around with, like, jam blocks and a couple yeah. of yeah. funny little things. To get... <laughs> and then Lots on the right, I mean, yeah. Guns N' Roses was famous for cowbell. So I, yeah. every song, almost every song had a cowbell in it. Right. Right. And I remember thinking, is this the secret sauce? The cowbell. Cowbell. That's why it's a hit. It's, <laughs> it's the cowbell. <laughs> I always tell people, I'm like, think about it. I go, think about the cowbell. Think about the hits. Is it subliminal? Is it something that simple that makes it a hit? <laughs> it's the cowbell. It's the cowbell. Honky Tonk Woman. Cowbell. Hard Day's Night. Cowbell. American Band. Yeah, we're an American band, Cowbell. Yeah. I mean, this this is one of those intros. I was like, as soon as you hear honky tonk woman and that cowbell part. Yeah. Yeah. 
I know. I know. People talk about these intros, these drum intros. They're like, oh, rock and roll. Yeah, okay. I know that one. But you think about setting up a song like that, you know, like a monkey tonk boom, doom, 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 doom. And it's just like, what? Yeah, I know. I mean, I know you got, you had a really long lasting relationship with Charlie and man, shit. I remember you telling me that story about when he called for the ride symbol. Yeah. Yeah. He was, he was just an amazing, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those things, Matt, too, where like I grew up, he was my hero, you know, as a kid growing up. So to, to get to know him, you know, at such a deep level and, and become friends was, you know, still something I, 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 I kind of can't believe sometimes, you know what I mean? I, I think about it and I go, man, he was just like, he wasn't putting me on, you know, I, you know, the first few times I kind of thought like, is he, is he kind of putting me on? He knows like I'm a, I'm a big fan and he's just, he's just being nice, but he was just that nice a guy, you know, he was just No, like, you were just cool, in the club, know? man. You were like, I met the guy once he blew me off. He was like, gay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, he, he liked you. You know, yeah, it's like, it's weird. I'm like that with Ringo. I'm, he'll yeah. call me. It's so strange. I'm like, <laughs> look at the phone. It's like Richard S is calling, right? I'm like, <laughs> I'm like are you kidding me? That's so, so cool, I understand man. that feeling, you know, because, you know, it's just, you're just blessed. It's just like, yeah, you got that moment right. with, the, you know, and I think he probably just, he's one of those guys that remembers, you know, that you're, the guy. I mean, the story you told me was he called you up at Zoltan and he goes, hello, uh, broken my rod symbol. It's a 20 inch with one rivet. And yeah. Like, yeah. like this, is, <laughs> this is Mr. Charlie Watson. At first you want to hang up, right? You're like, hey, someone's <laughs> messing with me. <laughs> right. But that's how it started. Right. Is yeah, that yeah, your story? Exactly. It was, I, I, I got a hold of him through, um, his, late drum tech Chooch McGee had left a message at Ocean Way and I told Chooch I had some old symbols that I wanted to send him some some new old stock like vintage A's from the 40s and Charlie called you know I sent a letter explaining what it was and uh and Charlie called and said I'd love to try the symbols I've broken one and it's a 20 a 20 inch swish with rivets all around it and oh, it was a swish it was a swish huh. and, and I, always said wanted, it, I always thought it was a flat ride and he was using he was using a flat later years later i might have told you that story where his flat ride started to develop some cracks and he called one day and he was a little he was really concerned about it and we made it was what he used wasn't a zildjian but we tried to clone it and we got pretty close but he was able to his tech was able to sort of save the flat ride that he had but he then had a backup and it made him feel a little more comfortable, you know, that he had something just in case. And you know how that goes if you're. Well, he loved, he played the same kick forever. Forever. Right? Yeah, and forever. He, the story I heard, he didn't change the kick drum head for like 10 years, right? Is that true? Yeah, I've heard that too. I've heard that too. I've heard that. Like why change it? It sounds great. Yeah. He you And know. he used to talk about how, you know, he'd compare old drums and old drum heads to like old shoes, you know, like they, they just feel better. They, you know, nothing fits better than like an old shoe. And, and, uh, yeah, he was, I mean, you know, I, he's a, he was a creature of habit like that. You know, he was, God, I mean, I know those nights when the kit's just perfect. And it's, it's like, whatever happened with that batch of drum heads. And I'm like, I'd say to Timmy some nights or other checks, don't change them. I love them. Yeah. He's like, yeah, but the snare's got a little bit of a thing in it. I'm like, yeah, it's okay. Like, I mean, traditionally, when I was hitting hard like that, you know, being maybe every three days, we'd have to change everything. Yeah, yeah. But then along came, you know, obviously a much different drummer than Charlie Watts. He was like more of a jazz cat. And he was, wasn't was killing him, you know, but he just, yeah. just the tone was there and it was him. My thing, I had to smack him and right, right. Uh, that we ended up going over to Remo and coming up with that. I mean, I don't know if a lot of people know this, but in the early days, we were like basically the guys that came up with the uh, the Emperor X. I didn't know that. Yeah. I didn't realize that. Wow. I was smacking through those things. And in the, in the days of, in that 
late 80s, early 90s era. It was pinstripes, man. Yeah, sure. For that flappy sound. That yeah. And it sounded huge in a stadium, but then that snare drum had, I remember I went to an emperor, but it's, it kept dipping in the middle. Yep. And I was just playing big rock sticks and just. <laughs> so I, I'm like, well, you guys already have the CS dot. Let's, why don't we try dropping a dot underneath? So we did that. And then I don't think I've ever spoken about that. I took credit for that or my drum tech at the time, Mike Fasano. Yeah, sure. When we were in the studio, but wow. we ended up using it. And I kind of use it pretty much to this day. That's a popular uh, head too. That's, that's. It's a thing, you know, with drum heads, I always say to people, you know, oh, this sounds dead or it's too dead or go, go around and tap it first. The tone, check the tone. If the head's got tone, it's a good head. If it doesn't, if it sounds dead, got to move the plastic a little bit. Because in the old days in calfskin, that was a different theory. It, the, the head already had the tone. Yeah, yep. And they put That's it right. on there and you <clears throat> tweak it. But then with Remo coming up with all the, you know, the way to glue it and everything, you still have to crack that glue. I would take them and, you know, go all the way around and then pop them on, stretch them. Yep. Get them going and then go around and tune every, get as much tone as you could. Because I've seen guys throw them on there and just be like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no tone at all. And I was a sucker. I was a stickler for tone. Like a lot of people say, they love my toms on all that GNR, but it was a do, 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 you know. Yeah. Well, what, what you just said, Matt, about like sometimes you tell Timmy <laughs> or your tech, like, you know, even though it's been a couple of days and the heads are a little beat, leave them on. Like, see, that to me is the sign of somebody who who hears good. To like, you're not dictated by, oh, it's been two days. I got to change my heads no matter what, which we know lots of guys that do that. They just go, well, doesn't matter what they sound like. It's been two days. I'm going to change them. But, you know, you're, you were basing it on the sound. You were going, man, they sound too good. I don't want to change these heads. That's. Yeah. When you find a guy that can tune like that, you know, I got, I got a little bit spoiled because now I was in the big leagues. Yeah. You know, in the old days, <laughs> when I was coming up in Hollywood, I had a Volkswagen. Right? <laughs> I had a VW. The front seat was taken out. Remember how you used to be able to take the back seat out and lay down seat yeah. in, a Volkswagen, in a Volkswagen bug? And I had the Man. kick drum was my passenger. Yep. And then the other drums would sit in back. I would just shove them all back there. And that's how I got around from gig to gig. And I set my stuff up. And then later on, I got a 64 Rambler station wagon. I was like, man, I can kick. And then the guitar player would be like, can you carry my amp too? <laughs> like, no. <laughs> no. But uh, but yeah, I mean, then when I got in the big leagues, I got a little lazy because I had Timmy. I mean, he was one of the greatest tuners. And yeah, great I, drum I, tech. I walk on stage. We didn't sound check. We would show up in the big stadium shows and just walk up and do the gig, you know, and I'd sit yeah. down and like, yeah. everything was just perfect. Perfect. You know, and, uh, and then later on, Timmy's like a big, big, uh, production manager now, Lenny Kravitz. And oh, Michael I didn't Clyde. realize that. Oh yeah. He's in the big, he's big now. I can't even get him. He was with drum key. Are you kidding me? I don't touch that. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I thought he was still. Te I knew he was working for Lenny Kravitz. He was drum teching for a while though, right? But he's but he was. He's, then he became production manager. Now he's production. Good for him, man. He deserves yeah, it. He, I mean, great guy. Those guys. I mean, some of the great techs of the world. I mean, I mean he worked for you. He worked oh. for Jimmy Chamberlain, Joey Kramer. He's worked for like the greatest drummers. You know. Yeah, like, yeah. After me, I think he went to Jimmy for a while. Then he went to Joey. And um, yeah, Timmy. Yep, that tells you. And you know, let's uh, let's talk Gretsch. I see your beautiful Gretsch drums back there. Yeah, I've I've got five other Gretsch kits, vintage kits. But these are my, these are the two I have in this room, and that's the left-handed one is the one that I practice on, and that one over here that, uh, that's called uh, what's it called? Black oyster? Not black oyster. Um, oh yeah. 
black uh, um, black pearl um or black diamond pearl black diamond pearl thank you matt that's a 62 that kit so 62 Ooh. round badge so that be a oh round badge Ooh. Yeah. so i got a funny story about black black diamond pearl so hagi-san from yamaha i call hagi-san i go because i always played black drums but i thought man mm. going out so fast forward to the big guns and roses metallica tour where we're doing stadiums um i think we played the big one there where the patriots played yeah you did you played in foxborough yeah uh i call hoggy son i go hoggy son i want to make black diamond pearl drums he says black diamond pearl okay man so we get to jfk stadium in washington dc and we're doing pre-production We've got like two days at the stadium, believe it or not, with full rigs. Yeah, I'll bet. And yeah. The drums show up in boxes from Japan. And uh we un we unbox them. And they're baby blue. <laughs> and the crew's walking by and they're like, hey, let me is there a girl drummer joining the tour? Is, let me know when you come out with man style. I swear to God, I was like mortified. I was like, oh uh, my God. I call Hoggy son. I go, Hoggy, I said black diamond pearl, not blue diamond. They had the same diamond in it, but it was yeah. blue. Oh. I was like, oh my God. And we set them up and I looked at him. I'm like, oh no. And I went to the lighting guy and I'm like, is there anything you can do? Can you hit me with like, what kind of light you got? Did, can you turn these drums black? <laughs> hey, me, can we, how, can we, what can we do? He's like, <laughs> everyone's laughing. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I ended up doing that whole tour on those drums. I think and I remember. I had, didn't, I didn't know the story, but I think I remember those drums. Yeah, they were, you know, in those days, that particular kit, I believe, was a recording custom, but I, I endorsed it. Rock Tour Customs. Mm -hmm. but I, I had that kit was made basically the same shells as like Steve Gadd or a guy like that played. Right. Recording Custom kit, it was called. And I believe it was mainly Burt Shell, right? That's right. Exactly. And it was, they were fat. They were fat sounding drums. And the snare, I remember the snare, I had a seven inch, seven inch deep. It was a custom drum by Yamaha, it was wood. And also I played the Zildjian Bell Brass. You remember that sucker? I do, yes, absolutely remember that. Yeah, the Noble and, and I still have that. I got that. And then I got the new one from the girls, from Craigie and- Yeah. Uh, the, the smaller girl, one, the, right, I think. Yeah, but the big one I got in like the eighties. I remember that. Yeah. And did, did we have to replace the shell on that one time? Did that, I feel like Timmy might've called me once about that too, that it was out around, she, wasn't it? Yeah. Or did it crack or something? Cause some of them did. Yeah. Did they crack. did. You know what happened? It cracked right on the, um, cause I believe, wasn't it, uh, Noble wasn't and Cooley. it in a, a collaboration with Noble and Cooley? Yes. Yes, indeed. Yep. And, and big die cast hoops. Yeah. Something happened where they put the, the, uh, the lugs on and a crack went across from one of the lugs. Yeah. And it happened on a few of them, Matt. It wasn't, you know, it was a semi common. That was the first production run of those. That and drum was, was, I used it on the cult almost the great. whole tour. The end, I, I remember it. I totally do. And I, I remember that. Yeah. Great sound and drum. I want to jump yeah. backwards a second because something you said earlier, and I, and I wanted to pick up on this. You mentioned, because Greg's told this story a few times, Greg Bissonette, our good friend. Yeah. Um, and all the years I've known you, I, you'd never mentioned it, but I had Greg on, on my show last year and he mentioned auditioning for David Lee Roth. And he said he, he was going in as you were coming out or something or something along the lines. <laughs> and, and he said, and I said, I didn't know Matt auditioned for David Lee Roth. He said, well, Matt didn't play double bass drums. And so I think Greg had played some double bass drums and made oh a mental God. note to himself like that. Okay. And he, I think he wrote something out like a, I don't know, but he, like when he went in there, he was ready for it because he because because of that information that you'd given him. I think as you were going, you were standing yeah. in line when I walked out. Yeah, that's what he said, and you were like, 
man, I don't know. I, I think I, I don't think I'm going to get it, man. They, they wanted a guy that plays double bass drum. So, so literally when I came out that door, there was great bassinet and Mark Craney standing there. That's, that's wild. And, but no one knew it was for David Lee Roth. Right. That's and, the other thing. Right. We all got called by Steve Vai and we we're like, Steve Vai is that guy from Zappa? Yeah. So when, when I walked in, I went, it was very clinical. We were playing like crazy time signatures and it was very Zappa school. Like yeah. he was yep. running yep. me through the mill. Like, give me a seven, four. And I'm like, okay, Genesis cinema show. You know, I'm like, I got that. Okay. Then he said something like play 26 over eight. Oh, and I was kind of cocky. And I looked up and I went, why? Yeah. Why? (laughs) And and then I said, I saw Billy Sheehan sitting on the couch. (laughs) I go, God, I'd love to jam. Can we jam? We didn't jam. Mm. I played by myself. And it was, it was probably the craziest audition I ever did. I never had a situation where I had to stand there and Steve, I was reciting all these notes and, and like running me through this whole school of, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And at that point in my life, I was priding myself on being pretty pure rock and roll guy. (laughs) Yeah. And then, but I looked at Greg Bissonnette and I knew he had all those other elements. Yeah. Yeah. You know, he's school, North Texas State, you know, and then Craney, same thing. Yeah, yeah. And uh, that so was- you knew you knew Greg from L.A. at that, t- like you kind of, you already knew who him who he was. And Well, I was in a band with his brother, Matt Bissonnette. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. And was, so there this, was this whole contingency of guys, right, in the mid-80s. There was Pat Torpy, you know, yeah. great drummer for Mr. Great Big. drummer, yep. Greg Bissonnette and... These other guys, and then Matt Bissonette, and there was another bass player in town named Bob Birch, who went on to play with Elton. Yeah, and we yeah. were kind of guys that would mishmash in other gigs, like, and me and Greg were the drummers at Disneyland as well. Right, right. Which was Stan Freeze, Josh Freeze's father. Yep. And we would all and Russ McKinnon. Remember Russ McKinnon? Of course, yeah, yeah. We were the guys that played Disneyland, and then. We would all sub for each other on other gigs. Like I would, we all had original bands, but Russ would call me and go, Matt, I got this, I got an original gig. Can you sit in for me at Disneyland? And we, we all knew top 40. Yeah. So I'd go down to Disneyland and sit in for Russ. And then I sat in for Greg before. Greg sat in for me. Same thing with those guys. That's so cool. Greg would give me charts. And I'm like, oh, okay. You heard <laughs> Miami Sound Machine? Awesome. <laughs> uh, working for the weekend by lover boy greg had charted out i'm like go 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 cowbell working for the weekend i'm like greg i got this song it's cool black, black <laughs> you know, it's like, like reading it you know like like you know <laughs> yeah yeah i remember one time I, we so there was three different stages at disneyland right there was tomorrowland there was the big stage the main they called the main stage Tomorrowland was the one that came out of the ground. You were like, and then we'd all run over and watch like Louis Belson at Carnation out, you know. Oh man. Buddy Rich. There was the yeah. jazz guys. So we'd all go, hey man, Louis Belson's playing tonight at Carnation Village. And you go over there, it was like the ice cream garden. Yeah. And they'd pay Louis Belson's band. Wow. And then Buddy was over there all the time. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. And then I met a very, very young drummer, Josh Freeze. At the age of 15, he was playing there. Wow. And I remember going, who is this kid? Yeah. Yep. And his father was the booker. Right. And his brother, Stan Freeze, and uh, another brother. Yep. Keyboard player, I think, right? <laughs> yeah, he's in Green yep. Day now. That's right. Yeah. Yep. And, uh, and then anyway, or Jason, I think his name is Jason Freeze. And his yeah, dad's yeah, for dad was Stan. Yeah. So, anyway, that's how we all were around, you know. And then everyone got great gigs. Like, but you know, Greg took off with uh, David Lee Roth. Yeah. And very closely after that, and close to that era, I got the cult. So I was cool. It was the right band for me. It was the right band for him. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Exactly. I always say that to people. It's like you know, you get these gigs, you get certain gigs that are going to line up the rest of your career 
you know i had opportunities to play with some bands i'm like mm, i'm not sure if that's the right script for me <laughs> you know yeah, it's like yeah. yep not gonna name names but there was a couple of bands like i think i'm just gonna keep eating top ramen <laughs> just, you know i'm gonna and, yeah, there's a, yeah, and then, yeah. you know, when the cult came, that set the tone for the rest of my career that I'm this kind of drummer. I'm a, I'm a rock drummer in this genre. And like, I think Guns N' Roses respected that I came from the cult. It might not be the same way if I was in maybe a different genre of a band. Yeah. Yeah. It can kind of come back to bite you. And, and, then, and when you, when they, if I remember correctly, when you joined Guns N' Roses, it was because... Were you guys on a bill together and they saw you play and, and kind of, I mean, did it happen that me or had they seen you play somewhere? Was it that sort of? Yeah. Movie? They came out to the universal amphitheater. That's what it was. Okay. And I remember it's in my book. There's a whole chapter where they come rolling in. It was like a scene out of fast times at Richmond. Eye. It's like, yeah, it was like a cloud of smoke, you know, <laughs> I'll bet and at the time the Sonic temple tour was winding, winding up. Yeah, we'd been out on a pretty long year and a half tour, and I remember going, "Man, yeah." As a joke, I said to my girlfriend, <clears throat> "I said, look at those guys, man. They look like fun." And literally, not long after that, Slash tracked me down through Lars Ulrich, who I wow, yeah, become quite good friends with. And at the time, I wasn't living anywhere. I didn't have a phone. It wasn't cell phones. I know, I know, yeah. You didn't so, call, you didn't text somebody. <laughs> it's like if you wanted to find somebody, you had to like call them on a landline. Yeah, and, and find out where them. they were, you know. And you're, like you say, you he had to do some some tracking down, <coughs> some Jim Rockford stuff to get. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I remember getting the call from uh, Mike Clink, the producer, and then called me and said, "Someone's going to be calling you." And I, I was like, I couldn't think of who it would be and slash called me up and invited me to come up and you know initially and i've said this a bunch of times in the press and everything i was just going to play on the record and then steven adler was going to come back and then it we just all hit it off and it was weird because i was already in the cult and i had a great gig and i loved that band and a lot of people still say to this day that that was like the perfect band for me it was like my groove you know but i remember thinking opportunity wise i had to make i had to make the move and they, they made me a member which meant i wasn't a side guy yeah you know i was a member of the band i was in the photographs i got the percentage it was like all that kind of stuff i'm starting to learn my way through the business yeah i can't say i did it perfectly but i was like Okay. And um, so I remember taking Billy Duffy to, to lunch and telling him, you know, hey, I got this offer. Hmm. It was it was hard. I'll bet. And then years later, I went back and I rejoined the cult. I remember that too. Yeah. I remember seeing great. you like years later with him. Yeah. We went back and I remember going back to them and going, you know, you guys can't make me a sideman anymore. You know, I was just in that <laughs> other big band. <laughs> <laughs> and we just got to be a band <laughs> and they're like okay mate well, you'll be an equal equal member i'm like great yeah so i always say to a lot of drummers drummers say to me like you know matt what did you do about negotiating your way into things you know i said well you gotta if you don't ask you don't get so right. don't blow yourself out though be careful it's like it's a fine line yeah it is you know it's like I think for drummers, it's hard because I think the old pre preconceived notion is that we're replaceable. It's going to be the first guy that's going to go, right? Yeah. We, need, we know we need the singer. We know we need the guitar player, probably. Bass player, man. Mm -hmm. Drummer, there's other guys. Yeah. So if you're a perfect fit and you feel like it's the, your band and the camaraderie is there and you guys have started maybe early together, that's a different situation. Then you have to just say, hey, I've been here huffing it with you guys from the beginning. But my situation, jumping out of a band like the Cult into GNR was, 
I already had a band. I had a bit of a negotiating tool there because yep. I wasn't just sitting on the sidelines going, hey, you know, I don't have a van. So the worst case scenario was they say no, and I go back to playing in the cult. And but they they were like, we want you. And mm. it was great. They they opened our, opened their arms to me and I had a great run with that band. Do you yeah, know? you did. And and I'm and I'm I'm going to say, and I, I correct me if I'm wrong, but it, it started a lifelong friendship with Slash because you guys continue to play together and, and later bands and um, a collaboration anyway. I mean, like just there were like other things that you guys worked together on. Yeah, well, we had Velvet Revolver, which was a big success for us. Yeah, huge. You know, and that was an interesting time because we all went through periods of out exploring our musical after being in this massive machine of a band. Yeah. I remember when we broke up in the nineties, it was like, Oh my God, what are we going to do now? Right. You know, I remember getting some calls from <clears throat> bands and I was like, I got to figure out how to adjust to this. And I remember I got into doing film scores. I started dabbling in producing. I actually had some success producing mm -hmm. and yeah. To be honest with you, I wasn't sure if I could pull it off again. I was like, <laughs> well, that was a fun run. I mean, yeah. how am I ever going to get to that level again? I don't think I, so why don't I just, you know, try some other stuff, do some other stuff. And then came full circle. I got back in the cult. We got a big record deal with Atlantic. And then, you know, Slash and Duff and myself kind of stayed close and, did stuff, but not in a big way. Yeah, yeah. And then in the early 2000s, we decided it's time for us to do a band. Let's do a band. And um, yeah, we, it was, we ended what up a signing band. with RCA and, so, you know, one got three Grammy nominations, won a Grammy and sold about 4 million records. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and cool. had a really good, that was a quick, lightning in a bottle run though it was like boom yeah and i remember when it hit when we had a hit which was the song called slither which we got the grammy for right. it was like literally going from like hanging out waiting to get going again to like it was on fire like <laughs> like we were on a press tour for like three months and we were like on every magazine and it was like the switch went on and we were like it and uh it was exciting i was like holy shit i can't believe we did this and it was probably for me one of the most exciting things that ever has happened in this, my career because we were in our 40s a lot of naysayers in hollywood were like hmm, mm -hmm. i don't care what band those guys were in it's kind of like they're getting a little older mm, rock and really and that's the kind of stuff you deal with in the business of music. Yep. And we proved them all wrong. And that was a real feather in our cap. And we looked great. We all got in good shape. Yeah. And it was all like, this has got to be. And I was fired up like a kid again. I was like, I felt like I was 20. I was like, ah. And it, it worked even harder because they always say the old expression is, the older you get, the harder you have to work. <laughs> and we did yeah, yeah we worked hard at our appearance we looked worked hard on harder than ever and i will give the props to slash and uh as we were at rehearsal every day at 12 noon we rehearsed six eight hours a day we were writing songs it was like boot camp mm, mm -hmm. dedication um, yeah and I'll say that to any young musician. I'll, they'll ask me, what do you think, man? I go, work your ass off. Right. It's not about your computer. Yeah. It's, this is like, go play all the time with other guys. Mm -hmm. And maybe if you're lucky, I think Kobe Bryant said it. He's like, if everybody else is practicing twice a day, I'm practicing four times a day. And we did. And it wasn't like, it wasn't even about like being the drummer that had all the chops in the world. It was more about being a band that had the chops together. Yeah. 
I think Charlie Watts would say yeah. that. Charlie exactly. Watts is the guy that's the band. He's not doing anything fancy. He's just cool. And Charlie was the foundation of the Stones, man. He was like, it all started there. Like you said, honky tonk woman or whatever he came in like. Yeah, yeah. And <clears throat> that unit of a band is what made the magic. So I think my career came up with that sort of mindset. Like if you find the magic, just nurture the magic and just work on getting the best songs, you know. That's that's great advice, Matt. That is, that's, I it, you know, it seems so simple, but in this world of like YouTube and, you know, where you can, you can post drum solos all day and social media, it's just so simple that the importance of playing with other musicians, man, just like learning yeah. how to play in time with a bass player and having it feel good and groove. And, and, and I was going to point out too, when you mentioned replacing drummers, um, I think you'll agree with this. You, you sing, you're, you're a great singer. I mean, you, I've seen you in all your bands sing backups yeah. and, uh, and that's a great, you know, it makes, gives us drummers more value. You know, it's not like you can just easily replace a singing drummer. You know, when you're when you're vocal. Right. Well, I always see I came up in the school of like you had to have extra attributes to offer. Yeah. So for instance, like if I were looking for a guitar player in a band or a bass player, we'd say, Hey, does he sing? Yeah. We were yeah. singing harmonies and background vocals. And so I say to young musicians, I say, Hey, you know, try to have as much stuff to offer as possible. I mean, you know, if you can sing, cool. That's just another, you know, thing you can offer the, the group. And I sang, I, I enjoyed singing in all my bands, plus gave me a real good sense of, of meter yeah. and like tempo. Because if you're playing too fast and the vocals doesn't fit within that tempo, you're not listening. Yeah. And I think if you look at drummers like Ringo and some of those great drummers that set up for the for the vocal, and I've talked to Ringo about this. He said, well, listen to the vocal. Don't step on the vocal. Yeah, exactly. Don't step on the vocal. Like, if you're listening to the vocal, you're gonna set it. You're gonna put some stuff around that vocal, or or launching into that chorus and setting up that big chorus. You're gonna you're gonna set it up really cool with a fill, and then boom. Yeah. And then you know, the solos come and build it, and then bam, then you're up on the ride, and you're like. You know, it's all about the dynamics and the tempo of the song. And that's, I pride myself on being just a song drummer. That's all I am. I'm not like fancy pants. You know, I'm like, <laughs> I'm like I can do some stuff, but uh, it's not my, it's not why I get hired to play with bands. Yeah. I think yep. you look at me like, Matt's got great meter. He looks pretty good. He's not a bad looking dude. He's like, you know, it's like, so he hits him right. He hits him. Yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. he he keeps good time and his great dynamics and drive the band. Drive, your job as a drummer is to drive the band. Right. You're in the driver's right seat. On. And yep. so guys are out there making fancy pants videos on YouTube. I'm like, <laughs> you see these kids and I'm like, oh, my God, I could never, ever play any of that shit. <laughs> yeah i know me too <laughs> but the thing the problem with that is when they go to play for some big artists and they're doing all that shit they're probably going to turn around and go don't do any of that that's right <laughs> exactly all exactly. that stuff you just did don't do any of it don't do it don't do it i gotta point out too to everybody um what you just yeah. said and and i know we're getting close to the time on this thing but um i want to point out if people haven't heard you play on the Buddy Rich uh, Memorial, the Buddy Rich uh, Big Band record that you did oh, yeah, in the yeah. 90s. Yeah. You played some ridiculous shit. And I remember we came in, it was while the Modern Drummer Festival was happening. It was yeah. like happening because you played at the festival that weekend. I remember that. A bunch of yeah. you guys did. And then Neil Parrott was producing it at a studio in New York City. A bunch yeah. of us came in. I remember I, I came in the studio when you were tracking. Oh, and I remember I was in there watching you and... I think you and Kenny might have recorded the same day, possibly. Yeah. You and Kenny Arnoff. It was and crazy. I've, yeah. And I've never heard you play like that, Matt. I'd never. And then I saw you play at the at the actual concert that they did 
in New York, like maybe oh, yeah. that Ian Kenny that? and Omar Hakim and Rod Morgan. Yeah. Neil Pert was there. And Neil Pert was there. And we we hung out at the Paramount. That was one of the craziest hangs of our lives. Know, I mean, as you know, John. Oh, oh yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> Can't even, I don't even think that's in the book. It shouldn't be, because people could lose their jobs, maybe, as a result. We got hammered. <laughs> oh man. Uh I, you were going to say something, but I... What was our old buddy? What was our old buddy from Zildjian? Lenny. Oh, Lenny Demuzio. Rest oh. his soul. Lenny was there that night. God, I got him hammered that night. I know you did. You got <laughs> us all here. Okay, if you're yeah, going to tell great. us... You... So everybody watching this, Matt, <laughs> you were you were buying rounds of Jägermeister for everybody. I mean, it was oh, just like... That was in a bad, bad way then. It was I, bad. That's it. A lot of that's in the book. When you read the book... Yeah. I go a little off the rails and the wheels come off a little bit, but. Well, you were a generous guy. You were always like a generous It happened. Guy. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, I love that night. I remember that night. You know, I was going to say real quickly. Yeah, that was an amazing, amazing opportunity as a drummer that maybe wasn't recognized as that style of drummer. So I got the call from Kathy, who I'd met at NAMM or one of those. And she calls me, says, Matt, we'd like to have you on these buddy tribute records. And I was like, at first I was like, oh my God, you know, yeah. it, was, it was that call you get where you're challenged and initially fear sets in. <laughs> and she says, Neil Pert's producing. And I'm like, oh, even double fear. Yeah. Like, oh. <laughs> and then she starts late naming off a list of people that are on the record. Steve Gadd. I'm like, oh, <laughs> Simon Omar Ford. Hakeem. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, Dave Weckl, you know, these guys, Vinny Caliuda. I'm like, why me? Because because we want a rock guy. Yeah. We yeah. want a rocker. It was smart. It really was. And then I go, okay, let me check out. Let me listen to Buddy's stuff. Okay. Early 60s. Hmm. Bula Witch. Funky Jam. Had like a <laughs> kind of a funk rock beat to it had swing mm -hmm. but it was rocking wasn't it yeah absolutely yeah and he explored that you know he went from his big band swing era into the 60s started dabbling in all different rhythms different stuff and i'm like yep. i'll do bula witch i can bite that off and killed it i remember walking in and dave wackles walking out and he's holding like his sticks and he's got his thing. And he goes, you got your charts? And I actually had a Sony Walkman on <laughs> and I was listening to Bulu Witch. And I go, no, but I got this Walkman. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember we set up at the power station in New York and I walked in and the whole band was there and they were looking at me like, <laughs> all tattooed and stuff. I'm walking in, you know, like I'd been up all night, a little puffy, drinking too much beer. Cause I was nervous. I couldn't sleep. Yeah. Yeah. I was on tour and I remember I flew in it, got picked up by buddy's driver in his little old limo. Wow. And he's like telling me these stories. I've been buddy's driver for oh, since the sixties, blah, blah, blah. So I'm in this old limo driving through New York. And then anyway, we go upstairs and I walk up to the band and uh, Steve Markison. Oh, yeah. God, listen listening. to the solo he did on that. It's like, yeah. <clears throat> guitar players can listen to that solo and interpret some of the greatest notes that they could take into this. Yeah. And anyway, I, I walked up to the band. I go, can you, give, can you guys give me like four bars at the top? And they go, well, four bars, huh? <laughs> and I go, and I remember it kicked in and the horns were coming at me. It was like so power that my initial reaction was, listen, play. Yeah. And yeah. It was like listening to another musician in a rock band, except for it was coming at you like a freaking freight train. Yeah, man. Yeah. Ba da ba da 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 da
And my limbs were just like, I was like, <laughs> what the hell's happening? And I looked over, there was a poster of Buddy on the wall. And I oh, said, man. thank you for possessing me. I'm not you. I'm never going to be you. Nobody's you. But Neil walked out and he said, wow, we got it. I said, what? One take? One take, yeah. One take. First Holy take. Holy shit. I was going to ask you how many <laughs> takes. Wow. We did, we did an extra. He goes, let's do one for safety. But I think that's the one. I was like, I looked at Neil. I'm like, I'm looking at Neil Pert. Going, are you, are you, you're kidding, right? Wow. I missed a couple of things. It was a little like ramshackle in a couple of spots. But in general, it's almost like, well, it had like a nice magic to it. Yeah. I, I, and I was I was there when you did. I remember, I know I either heard the playback there or I was there when you did it. But, um, and I remember honestly how blown away all the guys in the band were with you. Because I think, you know, without sounding like they were being judgy, I think they probably, they probably we're saw the judgy. tattoos. <laughs> yeah, they, they, I don't know. They, they, I don't think they realized that you'd be able to pull it off the way you did. You know, I think they thought, well, yeah. it's, it's going to be good to have him. He's going to help sell a lot of records because he's a famous drummer. Yeah. Um, and, but yeah, know, I'm sure there was preconceived notion. I mean, yeah, when you're when you're a rock guy, especially from a band like Guns N' Roses, you know, there's a there's a thing that's like, man, do, do these guys play good? Are they? Yeah, exactly. You know, can they play? Or, um, and I think, you know, I've morphed into so many different styles of music. It's like for me, it was like, I'm just gonna listen and be more. Yeah as best I can be inside the music. You know, it's like, it's almost like the way I have to play for Billy Gibbons now. I go back to a whole different style. I, I'm, a, I'm actually playing a style of music that I grew up with. I I cut my teeth down in Louisiana in a blues band, three-piece blues band when I was 19. Wow. I, you know, know I was that. playing the blues yeah. down there and Texas shuffles. And then that kind of, I didn't need it for 30 years. Yeah. I didn't use it. I played big rock shuffles, but I didn't play the Texas shuffle. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I remember going, okay, here comes Billy. I better go which at this, which as a lot of drummers know that Texas stuff is the easiest shit to play. And it's more subtle. No. It's like there's subtleties. It's not big rock at all. That's right. And it's, it's almost like the opposite, Matt, really. When you think about it, it's like you're playing all those like ghost notes with your left hand and you know where you're playing like these big slamming you know two and four quarter notes with rock you got to play all those little ghosty things you know yeah i think for a lot of drummers like if you think about stylistically on drummers and guys that are jazz drummers and they're so great at playing jazz they can't launch into maybe what i do right and the same says in the same respect it's very difficult for me to go back into the subtleties of what they do yeah yeah so that's why we all have our sort of unique position you know it's like there was a point in my life when you know i was listening to it like i described i was listening to aldi miola and return to forever and lenny white and my friends came over and they're like matt you can't go into jazz fusion man you got you gotta <laughs> play sabbath with us, you know and at that point i had to make sort of a overall decision about this is going to be who I am. Yeah. And that's what I sort of focused my, you know, what style I was going to be in into. Yeah. Your and, direction. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, I think maybe drummers look at it like, well, it's just straight rock. I mean, it's really like, you know, it's not a bit a lot to it. Meat and potatoes. Mm -hmm. But ask Phil Rudd, he'll tell you. That's I mean, right. There's no, one, there's no one like Phil Rudd. Oh. When Phil Rudd's not in ACDC, in my opinion, it doesn't sound like ACDC. Yeah, exactly. And and just John Bonham. Right. John Bonham. Okay. Did he have elements of R&B? Did he have a lot of swing? There was jazz in there. Yes. Bill Ward, jazz drummer. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. still, I'd say to rock young rock drummers, go listen to all that shit. Listen to Gene Krupa listen to you know these guys take yeah. everything that you can from everything it's like a smorgasbord yeah you know that's great advice and and i know we're, we're you've gone a long time and i really appreciate it <coughs> and and you probably need a glass of water but i want to just ask um 
Yeah, good. Have some water. The the name of the book. It's called yeah. Double Talk and Jive. Double Talk and Jive. I love it. And the reason it's called Double Talk and Jive is it's the song on Future Illusion that me and Izzy Stradling recorded. And it starts out on the floor, Tom. And uh, I remember thinking, that just basically says it all. Mm, mm. Double talk and jive. Double talk and jive. I have. Yeah. <laughs> I I should have got these ready behind me in that pile of records that I have yet to put on my wall down here. Uh-huh. I have both use your illusion, use your illusion one and two, uh, platinum multi platinum records that you sent me. Um, nice. Many years ago, you came to my office at Zildjian. This would have been, um, I'm thinking like early '90s because those. Those records came out in 91, 92, yeah. 91. And you mm-hmm. were on tour. I came to see you at the Boston Garden. Then you came to Zildjian and you looked in my office and you said, where's your Guns N' Roses records? And I said, I don't have any. And you made a phone call. I swear yeah. to God, you made a phone call. And like, and, and, and like you said, in those days, we didn't have cell phones. Like you called a number and like four days later, they showed up. Wow. And I so appreciate that. And I'm, I'm sorry I didn't, I should, well... Next time I like how you have them leaning up there. It looks cool. Well, thanks, buddy. They're they're there, and I'm proud of them. Well, and in a recording I'm studio sure. here in the desert, I'm going to have a full drum room. It's going to be sick. So I have this Duco Gretsch kit that they made yeah. for me. Beautiful. They're, they're Brooklyn's. Yep. Great recording drums. I just did a soundtrack for a movie with the Shooter Jennings, Waylon's kid on those Ducos. And I'm like, whoa. They're not older drums, but they sound killer. Yeah, yeah got a big yeah. duco kit and then i'm going to have a little broadcaster kit that's green it's a cadillac green i'm gonna have a small kind of setup i can do thumpy like ringo kind of stuff and then i'm gonna have a big rock kit out here in palm springs beautiful and we'll be able to you know if you're ever swinging through town come check it out absolutely absolutely but Matt, thank you so much for, for being here today with me. I so appreciate it. And No, I mean, I'm so happy to see you. I've always loved you, man. And oh, thank you. You're really one of the early supporters of the Matt Sorum uh, project. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, man. I, I, well, I feel the same way about you. You know, I, I yeah. we met when I was just kind of on my way in the, into the business. So, you know, I feel like we, we really bonded immediately and, and here yeah. we are, you know, all these years. We've had been a pretty good life so far. Yeah. Yep. We've been. Thanks, man. I'm really glad, glad to see you, and we were able to reconnect and, you know, Me talk too. talk shop, drums, for music, life. Great. Likewise, too. Well, hang tight. I'm gonna. I'll end the the recording, and uh, thank everybody for watching. A big hand for Matt Sorum. As Ringo would say, peace and love, peace and love. Peace peace and love, peace and love. And don't forget to pick up Matt's book. It'll be available by the time you see this. And it's Double Talk and Jive, and it's probably going to be on Amazon and anywhere you can can find it. So, great. All right, well, hang tight one second, Matt, and we'll uh, we'll end the, uh, the broadcast. Thanks again, buddy. Great to see you. Nice.